Sir John Chilcott, the two million word, ten million pound, eight year inquiry man, appeared in front of the House of Commons Select Committee this week. When asked if Tony Blair had lied, he answered with an expression of pure Whitehall Mandarin speak, the likes of which I have never heard. He was asked, had Tony Blair lied? He answered, Mr. Blair went beyond the facts. And thus enters our lexicon, a new and damning description of our political class, of whom more later. So just to be sure, folks, the million people who died in the invasion and occupation of Iraq did not really die, they just went beyond life. You can call me on what I am about to say, or you can tweet me at George Galloway, or at Talk Radio, or at both. Beyond belief is the fact that the political ground is moving under the feet of Hillary Clinton. After all these weeks and months in which it was held as self-evident that Clinton was the next U.S. president, trust me, she's going to have some sleepless nights between now and Tuesday. Donald Trump has moved into the lead in the presidential contest. And in the crucial swing states, Trump has begun to pull ahead. And thus, as they say in the American political parlance, a path not as narrow as before has begun to open, along which Donald Trump might, by the early hours of Wednesday morning, be president-elect Donald Trump, who'd have thunk it. I'll tell you one of the consequences of that. There will be a peal of laughter from one corner of the earth to the other. There will be a peal of laughter at any subsequent contention that the United States of America is some kind of model, a country built on the genocide of a hundred million original inhabitants, then the slavery of millions of black people, and the apartheid after the abolition of slavery. And don't forget, as I tweeted this week, when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, he turned the cavalry westward to carry out the genocide of the original Americans. Well, all of those crimes and sins will be capped. Actually, whoever is elected president on Tuesday. But my main thunder this evening is reserved for the absurdity of a binding referendum, the final say, the final say, said the Prime Minister on introducing the Referendum Bill Now Act, the final say will be with the British people on the question of whether or not to leave the European Union. Now, some people have made this very complicated in the last 24 hours. I hear people waxing about the supremacy, even sovereignty, of Parliament. Have you seen Parliament? Have you smelt Parliament? I was nearly 30 years in Parliament, and I tell you, I wouldn't send most of the members of Parliament out to buy a loaf. With all that we know about this low parliament, how can people with a straight face contend that parliament is supreme, parliament 
is sovereign. The people in this country in 2016 are sovereign, are supreme. Not any queen or king, not any court, and certainly not the Augean stables, the gang of thieves and liars who inhabit what is miscalled the British Parliament. In any case, there's no need to argue about it. It was clear in the introduction to the referendum bill that the final say on whether or not to leave the European Union would lie with the British people. But that was overturned by the High Court judges yesterday. There's no point in people obfuscating that. It was overturned. And for this reason, you cannot leave the European Union without triggering Article 50. And therefore, it is axiomatic upon the decision of the referendum that Article 50 has to be triggered. Not if the members of Parliament want to or not. Now, some say the MPs wouldn't dare not trigger it. That isn't the point. Article 50 is a necessary method of executing the binding decision made by the British people in June in the European referendum. Now, it is unlikely that the MPs in the Commons will block Brexit. But what about the Lords? What if the Lords seek to block the triggering of Article 50? What if the Commons doesn't block the triggering of Article 50, but begins to amend the government's motion to do so with all kinds of conditions, some of which I might like, some of which I might detest. It then slows to a snail's pace the, the method of executing the British popular will. And that's unacceptable. I said on the morning of the referendum result, as did Jeremy Corbyn, by the way, though he since resiled from it. I said that morning, trigger, trigger, Article 50, now, right now, this day. And if she had done that, if Cameron had done it before leaving, if Cameron hadn't left, or if May had done it, immediately upon becoming the Prime Minister, we wouldn't be in this mess. But by delaying, she has now left the uncertainty potentially open as far as the eye can see. Now, there's only one way out of this, and that is a general election. Because if the people, as I contend, are sovereign in this country, then if anybody is going to decide what kind of Brexit we're going to have, it must be the British people in a general election. I have no problem about Parliament being involved in what the British negotiating position should be, but not this Parliament. A new Parliament has every right to say we must defend workers' rights, we must keep uh, human rights law. We must uh, secure the position of those immigrants from the European Union countries that are already here. I, I have many conditions myself. Jeremy Corbyn has many. Many of his are the same as mine, but some are different and one or two crucially so. I've got no problem with that. But the question of triggering Article 50 and beginning the two-year clock is a matter, is a decision that has already been taken by the British people in the referendum. And no bewigged popinjay in the High Court has the right to defy it. And no bewigged popinjay, yes, Michael Fabricant, I mean you, no bewigged popinjay in Parliament 
has the right to block it either. And therefore, now that the court has opined, the matter goes to the Supreme Court. What an irony it would be should it end up in the European Court. But I don't suppose anybody would be up for that level of embarrassment. But it's all an embarrassment as far as I am concerned. And finally, let me say this. If any attempt is made through obfuscation, through the placing of obstacles, or through direct defiance, if anyone seeks to block the sovereign decision of the British people to leave the European Union, there is a risk to social peace in this country. If we were not the British, if this were not Britain, if this were, say, Europe, then burning tires would already be on the street. Maybe burning vehicles would be on the street. But because we don't do that kind of thing, at least not for a few hundred years, the British people are being asked stoically to observe what seems to me like an establishment manoeuvre in the dark to cheat, to rob the British people of the destiny that they have chosen. I had my say. Let's hear from an expert, Peter Cattrall, a lecturer in public policy and democracy at the very prestigious Hansard Society. Peter, welcome to the show, my friend. Hello, George. How are you? I'm good and glad that you could make it, Peter, because I want you to help us clear one or two things up. I see some, uh, some are fools, some just misguided, uh, claiming that uh, this is a rerun of the English Civil War and that any right-thinking person would be on Cromwell's side. This flows from the uh, royal prerogative issue which is the prerogative with which Mrs. May, if she had had any sense, would have triggered Article 50 at the first moment that she was able to do so. But actually, it, it's not a rerun of the Civil War, is it? It's about whether the people's decision in the referendum is superior to any decision that Parliament might make or the courts might advise that they should make. Am I right about that? Well, not exactly, no. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not that it's a rerun of the Civil War, uh, although, as you say, it is partly about the use of the royal prerogative, and it's certainly not about stopping the people's will being enacted. What it is about is the law. So the judgment starts off by saying this is not a matter of politics and it has no bearing whatsoever on the question of whether Britain is leaving the EU or not. It is a matter of pure law. Now, of course, the referendum was set up as a piece, uh, as a result of a law enacted in Parliament. So complaining about what happens as a result of one law and having a law, uh, that law then uh, scrutinised seems a bit kind of odd. Um, the problem with that piece of legislation, the 2015 European Union Referendum Act, is it's extremely badly drafted, as the judges point out in their conclusions. So it does not establish uh, what uh, the powers uh, that flow from that act uh, could be deemed to be. It say, uh, the judgment indeed says uh, that all parties to the case agreed that it, uh, the act does not give the power to trigger Article 50 because it's, Article 50 is not even mentioned in that piece of legislation. So <coughs> the government therefore had to go for using the royal prerogative. Now, their the claim for using the royal prerogative is based upon the idea that treaties, which are also never consulted with the public, um, are somehow uh, is somehow the way of doing this thing. Now, historically, tr the right to make and break treaties, the right to make law, the right to prorogue parliament, all of these kinds of things, as you know, have been crown prerogatives. 
the question is, does, you, does the government have a royal prerogative to enact something, um, to, to change the law in this area, when it's not been specifically provided for. Well, look, you're at the because, hand side. Because, no, no, i just finish uh, this, this point off, George, if I may. Because it's not just about a treaty. It's not just about international law. It's also about domestic law. And that's part of the uh, court case, that the uh, Parliament has not specifically provided for this to, to happen. Therefore, Parliament has a right to scrutinise. There is, of course, a huge difference between scrutiny and veto, although a lot of mischievous people seem to be mischie- uh, 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 misconstruing the relationship. Between well, the, the there's no, but Peter, there's no difference at all because neither you nor I know what the result in the voting lobby would be if someone uh, tabled a veto uh, to whatever new legislation is now going to be necessary as a result of the court case. So a veto is in the hands of 650 members of parliament or any majority of those voting. So it, it, it is entirely in the lap, if not of the gods, then of those lesser gods, the members of the House of Commons. Now, here's my point. You're from the Hansard Society, and I was nearly 30 years in Parliament. Both of us know that British legislation is very seldom badly drafted. Now, it's true that Article 50 isn't referred to in the Act because there is no need to. Article 50 is axiomatically required to be triggered if the sovereign decision of the people in the referendum is to be given effect to. Now, it is surely, for me, and I'm not a lawyer, it's a matter of simple logic. You cannot leave the EU unless you trigger Article 50. We voted to leave the EU. Therefore, de facto, Article 50 automatically has to be triggered, surely. Uh, well, no. Uh, why should it be? It's not in the uh, Act, nor is anything else in the Act. There is no um, description in that Act of anything, which uh, any description of what happens as a result of the legislation. The only thing we have is the commitment of the government um, that they would respect an in-out referendum. That's in the Tory manifesto. They also, of course, have on the same page as that manifesto that a commitment to remaining in the single market. So uh, there, is, uh, there is no clarity about exactly what uh, leaving the EU actually means in practice. Well, the, now, the Prime Minister's now, words... Now, no, Peter, the Prime Minister's words in introducing the bill well, that the British people would have the final say. But now they won't have the final say. The final say will be the majority in the House of Commons when this matter, presumably unless the Supreme Court overturns yesterday's decision, uh, is debated and voted upon. So the, the final say is not with the British people. The final say would not have been with the British people in the way Cameron drafted that bill anyway because it was not something which specified what an, a, a leave process actually meant in practice. And you know that. So uh, it, it is uh, pointless to, to argue that it means anything else. Well, it's not at all <laughs> pointless. Uh, there's millions of people incensed and fearful well, I, I, about, I, I what the, about what the consequences of this might be. I, I absolutely agree, but uh, I think it is not... Uh, the case that this means that there will be a veto. Um, but you don't we, know that, Peter. Nobody knows we, that. We, no, of course we don't know that absolutely, but what we are aware of is enough Labour MPs have said that they will vote leave because that's what their constituents want to make it sure that that will happen. I know lots of Tory MPs who will vote leave uh, when it comes to a vote um, because of those things as well. But what doesn't necessarily specify is how uh, or what they think they're voting for. Now, it seems to me that what the government wants to go for is something which uh, avoids tying their hands so that they can max, uh, they have a max, maximum flexibility over how they actually try and negotiate 
Brexit. Um, and I can understand them wanting to do that. Um, but the uh, uh, problem is that you're going to end up with a situation where they're going to be uh, delivering a Brexit, which probably very few people voted for. Certainly, the, the guy who resigned from Parliament today didn't vote for the kind of Brexit that Mrs May is heading for. Well, the referendum was a binary choice, in yes. or out. Now, what kind of Brexit is entirely uh, a matter for Parliament, for the public, for the press, for the media? Uh, everyone should have a say on what kind of Brexit. Of and the best, the best way of testing that is for Mrs May to table her intended form of Brexit and Mr. Corbyn to table his, and then have a general election, surely. That would certainly be a more satisfactory outcome than this, because I suspect what the government are trying to do is avoid scrutiny over these things. And I think a lot of people's anxiety about uh, this was, of course, not just related to this referendum, but the risk that it would set a precedent for governments in future to use referendums to enact things without scrutiny, without um, uh, being held to account for what they're doing. Uh, so, and as you can see with the government at the moment, they've been introducing various ideas which weren't in the Tory manifesto at the last election and almost treating the, the uh, referendum as giving them a new mandate to do a whole series of things that they didn't put in the manifesto, whilst also junking loads of things which were in the Tory manifesto at the last election. So, yes, a new uh, general election would be desirable, uh, I think, in these circumstances. Whether it's going to happen is, of course, another question. I, I note that a number of Tory Brexiters are now talking about uh, the, their desire for a new election, um, but I suspect Mrs May will be resistant to it for at least two important reasons. One of which is that, of course, she wants the boundary changes to go through before the next uh, election. And the other, well, I, I wonder what you think about this, being a Scot, George. Um, do you think that there's a risk or a possibility that in Scotland a new general election will be treated as a... Uh, issue for a mandate for a second Indy ref? No, I don't think so. Of course, the Scottish National Party are virtually hegemonic, although one shouldn't, at least in terms of seats, uh, but not necessarily in terms of votes. A very significant number of SNP supporters voted for Brexit, and a former minister, Alex Neil, uh, in the newspapers in The Telegraph today, tells us that he and a number of SNP members of the Scottish Parliament actually voted for Brexit in secret. Uh, mm. The majority of people in Scotland at this moment do not want even a second referendum on no, independence, never mind yes. uh, have, uh, have uh, come to the conclusion that they're going to vote for it. Of course, the boundary changes uh, is an issue, and that doesn't happen until 2018. But I believe that the case for a general election will become irresistible before then because Mrs May cannot go into the next election other than promising a hard Brexit. Let's use that shorthand. And yes. therefore, Labour and the Liberals will go into that election, I believe, promising something less than a hard Brexit. And it's, we need to know where the public stand on this. Or we could have a government negotiating a form of Brexit that the majority of people in the country don't want. I, I absolutely agree. I, I suspect a lot of Tories, like Stephen Phillips, don't want the hard Brexit that it looks like significant members of the government actually favour. What, what um, uh, Theresa May means by Brexit is, of course, a slightly different matter because she's been very careful to keep her cards very close to her chest, both during the campaign and subsequently. And I wonder uh, whether that's one reason why we might not be quite so likely to see a um, general election soon, because it seems to me that one of the reasons why she doesn't want parliamentary scrutiny 
of the Brexit process is not just because she thinks that uh, the the other side might veto it because they can't. Let's face it; she's got a majority in, in Parliament, but because she's afraid of what her own backbenchers might do in terms of kicking off. Well, Brit- um, uh, Tory prime ministers afraid of their own backbenchers well, over Europe. Yeah. Who'd have thunk it, Peter? Thank <laughs> well, you very before, much. Of course. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. That was Peter Catrell, lecturer in public policy and democracy at the Hansard Society. Let's squeeze in a call from Chris in North Yorkshire on Brexit. Go ahead, Chris. Hello, George. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, I'm a working class bloke, yeah? Yep. Um, who voted to leave the European Union. Ditto. And, and I am absolutely sick to the back teeth of the establishment in this country uh, completely treating me and people of my class like absolute serfs who have no brain, who have no idea what Brexit was all about. And since June the 24th, the day after Brexit, I believe that there has been a concerted effort by the British establishment through people like Tony Blair and Mandelson and all the other puppets to undermine, deliberately undermine, that decision of the British people on June the 23rd. And what they've done is they have uh, muddied the waters, they have created so much confusion, so much chaos, that now people don't know where they are with everything. And I saw Owen Smith on the Daily Politics programme this afternoon, and he unashamedly said that basically this whole thing for him, with a High Court ruling yesterday, was a way of delaying and stalling uh, Brexit. Yeah, even though his constituents voted heavily in favour of Brexit. And, 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 and he came out and he actually said that, like, him and his ilk wanted a second referendum. Now, for me, personally, I feel such a frustration with inside of me because of all this, because it's like, it's like, pick a card. You can have any card, pick a, no, no, you can't have that card. We picked a card that they didn't want us to have. And because of that, they, they have such an arrogance. They have such an arrogance that they, get, they think they can actually go against their own constituents. And for me personally, I feel as though I have to try and, and I'm only just a member of the public, but I feel as though I have to try and do something to try and 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 stop this. You know, whether it's a march, a rally, and I hope and I pray that because this is I, I'm of the left, and I, all my family on my dad's side have been of the left, socialists, trade unionists. But this isn't an issue of left and right, and it's been made to be an issue of solely the right, and it's it's left and right. On, on both sides that wanted to, to leave the European Union. People like Tony Benn, God bless his soul, you know, he, he was a, a, a staunch advocate of getting out because it is yes. so undemocratic. And Bob Crow, and both, God bless, bless his soul too. Bob Crow, Tony Benn, that's the banner that I marched under. That's the, and, and, the and, direction and I hoping, voted. I'm, I'm hoping that, that politicians on the left and the right, who want, who can see how undemocratic the European Union is, who can see what a rich man's club it really is, how it has no regard for people at the bottom end of the, uh, of the pyramid. I hope and pray that somebody, a politician or politicians on, on, on both sides of the spectrum, who, who want it out, will come together and organise some kind of mass uh, rally or or march or something because because it cannot the British people cannot keep on um, just accepting this undemocratic uh, carry on from people. Well, Gina, uh, Gina Miller, who is she? I, I have you no know. idea, um, but it's not her fault that the court decided uh, how it did. If she hadn't brought the case, someone else would have, Chris. But the word you used several times in that excellent call, was democratic. This is now not about left or right. 
This is about the democratic decision that the British people made. And whether or not a judge or an MP has the right to countermand it. Go ahead, Steve. Well, good evening, George. A pleasure to speak to you this evening. And to you, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to ask, George, about uh, the uh, court case this week and about this situation about um, the scrutiny, the, the Conservative Party trying to allay scrutiny of itself over the way that it wants to negotiate things into the uh, going out of the EU. Now, um, I, I think we can't leave it to the likes of May and Liam Fox and people like that to negotiate. I think the EU referendum was a cross-party thing, George, mm -hmm. and I think this ought to be a cross-party thing too. Well, uh, uh, they offered, and uh, they were right to offer, Corbyn offered a Labour input into the negotiating strategy. Yeah. And the Tories have refused it. Of course. So yeah. the responsibility is theirs. They will pay a price if they negotiate a kind of Brexit, which the British people don't want. Uh, and that's why we need a general election to avoid uh, a, a, a final Brexit after two years after the triggering of uh, Article 50, uh, yeah. which is uh, unacceptable to the British people. The, the There's only two ways out of that. One, you have effectively, as we had in the Second World War, uh, a coalition on this subject negotiating with the EU, and that's what I would favour. Yes, uh, but if we don't have that, then we must have a general election, and each side must table its kind of Brexit. But what can't be allowed, Steve, and what has now been allowed, uh, even if only in theory, uh, by the decision yesterday, is that the House of Commons could vote not to trigger Article 50, could vote not to, therefore, leave the European Union as the people already decided we must. Yeah. Well, George, I, George, I really can't see that that would be the case. I, I can't see that the MPs would vote and stop after the referendum and the, and the people's decision. Well, the Lords might, Steve. Uh, well, well, the they, Lords, yeah. They, they don't have to face anybody. Yeah, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. They're there, for, they're there forever. More fool us for tolerating that. Steve, thanks for the call. Excellent. David's in Glasgow on the same subject. Let's hear from him, David. How you doing, Judge? Very good. Nice to hear from you. Go ahead. First of all, first of all, I have no respect for those who have no respect for the rule of law. You understand? Ourselves in the English live in civilized countries. We are governed by the law. You understand? Now, as you know, ourselves in English are in a union. As you know, Scotland and England participated in a treaty of union in both countries introduced that, that treaty within the domestic laws. Ourselves with the Union with England Act and English with the Union with Scotland Act. Terms and conditions. The Scottish people said we will surrender some of our independence conditionally with these terms. Do you understand? These terms. And those laws are still the laws of the land. And within the Union with Scotland Act, the English in the 1700s agreed that the private rights of Scottish people will not be altered unless for the benefit of the Scottish people. You understand? Our private rights cannot be altered unless it is done for the benefit of the Scottish people. What's your point, Caller? What's Parliament, your point, Caller? By the Parliament. That's the law. Explicitly states it can only be altered by the Parliament. I have to respect these three judges in that English High Court. I have to give them total respect. Are you a Rangers are man? Are you a Rangers man, David? Law. Am I a what man? Are you a Rangers man? Am I a Rangers man? What's football got to do with anything? What has football got to do with right. <laughs> Let's go to Colin. To Let's go to Colin in Oldbury uh, on the same subject, but also adding the US. Go ahead, Colin. Hello, George. Hi, mate. Oh, what a mess. An absolute mess we're heading into. Mm -hmm. Us and our cousins in America. 
Well, I just looked at the latest poll, Colin, the poll of polls, that is the amalgam of all the polls, and it's 45-45. Oh, it's like, you know, well, like we said last week, every, they're both as bad as each other. They, they, our poor people over there are looking into a precipice. There's no way out from either way. And I would have to urge them, try and look independent. Because there's nothing there for them. It's just bickering. Oh, it's just a mess. And the stuff that's coming out about, you know, I don't want to go into it on this show. But no, because it's before the watershed. It's, it's too, it's oh, too yeah, I dirty. I know. I mean, you know, you've got to get on the horror channel to watch what's going on with that lot. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very oh, good, very good. Disgusting. Now, Colin, what, what's your what? view on the court decision this week? Oh, well, you know, I'm actually ashamed... I'm disgusted and I'm ashamed that we, the people here, have been told David Dimbleby questioned politicians, Andrew Neil questioned politicians. I've seen you on Andrew Neil's show, and you've all been questioning these politicians. And the answer was, it's and Marco Portillo got told the same. It's a simple in or out. You hit it on the nail at the beginning of your show. Simple in or out. We was all told this. He wasn't told about what I said last week about the ready Brexit and all this stuff they're coming out with now. This was in or out. And all I can say is I'm seeing now is these, uh, probably those politicians that are at the top are in on this as well. She's been dragging herself, just waiting for it to go to the court so they can say, well, we'll fling it for a vote in Parliament and all of that. And to me, it's piggy in the middle with people. Yep, the people nope. that went for this vote. And also, George, I've got to make an appeal to everybody out there. You need to pull yourselves together. It's beyond the Brexit now. This is your democr democracy going. This is your democracy going down the pan. And you need to pull together and fight for that. This vote is practically gone as far as they're concerned. They're going to manipulate... Well, there's no doubt, Colin, uh, and uh, an earlier caller made this uh, clear also, <coughs> that from the day and hour that we won the referendum and decided to leave, there has been uh, a conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a vast conspiracy. George it involves the European it. Union, it involves private companies, shortages of, uh, of Marmite and surcharges on, uh, on uh, phones and, and, uh, yeah, and yeah. tablets and, uh, and so on. There's even people, I was reading uh, today, putting up the price of their laundry charges in their hotel and blaming it on Brexit. There's yeah. been uh, an avalanche of establishment propaganda to try to persuade people that they made the wrong decision. And now we have a mechanism whereby the people can be, can be cheated out mm. of the decision that we made. Yeah. That's why I'm angry, and that's why everybody else forward? should be angry. Can I just put this forward as well before I get off? Yeah. You know, if they prove to the people here that they can take charge of something like that, which we was told we was going to vote on and it was going to go through and Brexit meant Brexit, if they prove to the people who I feel some of them are asleep, they don't seem to realise what's going on. They need to pull together and fight for the democracy because the thing is, they will go for another vote to start to go into war in the Middle East and nobody here will have the say on it because they will have shown you, here's my foot, it's on your face, and we're going to do what we want, and you will back us. Yep, Don't okay. Don't let it happen, people. Thanks, Colin. A very uh, sombre warning uh, from Colin there. Regents Park, s and S tweets, the UK is ripe for a new political party, which is not the traditional main two, but not EU-phobic either. What an interesting possibility. Have we got time for Tony in Ghoul in East Yorkshire this time? Go ahead, Tony. Hi, George. Uh, Hi. Thank you for taking me call. I'll keep Welcome. it quick. I'm just going to simply say I'm not angry. I'm not sad. I just feel sick to the stomach. Me, my guts have been ripped out. Unlike you, I voted for Remain in the referendum. But this now is just ridiculous. If we're going to get to a situation where the British people have voted 
and High Court judges and politicians through their own financial gains and greed are blocking the will of the British people that I'm ashamed to have yeah. voted because the d democracy's gone. It's a kind it of coup, you know, Tony. Yeah, I do. I, I'm, to, to be honest now, I've lost all respect in, in, in politics because if I'm going to say to my lad who's 24 and people listening out there that in the next general election, whether you vote Liberal, Labour, Conservative or whatever, go ahead into the polling stations, put your cross on a mark, your, uh, your vote might count, but then again, it might not. What future have we got? I, 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 there's no fight. I just feel, I just feel sick. And that's from somebody who voted Remain, George. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very, very glad to hear that, Tony, because this now transcends not just left and right, but it transcends how you voted in the referendum. The, the issue is, who rules this country? Is it the people, or is it the bewigged, or is it the corrupt liars in the House of Commons? Do they own us, or do we own them? Do we tell them what to do, or do they tell us what to do, Tony? That's the question. Well, all I'm going to say before I get off, George, is you, I listen to your calls. I don't always agree, but on this one, you have nailed it 100% right. It, politics don't come into it. It's just corruption. And to me, it just smells of something very, very, very murky. Yeah, otherwise, why are they doing it? Why are they going to all this trouble if, as the Hansard Society fellow said, they've no intention of vetoing it? Why then go to all this trouble? Why then spend all this money? Why invest all this political capital? It's clear that there's something up. We might not yet be able to see the final shape of what comes next, but we are not stupid. We know that something is coming up. That was Tony in Ghoul bringing to an end the first hour, but the good news is there are two more hours to go. Are we going to sit on our hands and let idly pass by a kind of coup taking place in our country where judges are handing Parliament the power that the people thought they had. And what are the American people about to do on Tuesday? I can scarcely believe what I'm now seeing in front of my face. Uh, now, I've not been reading uh, enough uh, tweets, so let me read a few more. Rich Turner says, a few more Tory resignations and May will be obliged to call a general election anyway. Corbyn is ready. I hope so. George, please help to correct this. It seems to me that these undemocratic remoners will never accept that they lost and will try any devious delaying stunt to stop Brexit. Call in any friends or favours to put this right. Otherwise, we have been duped and cheated. And John Wren says the Democrats deserve Trump as president because they cheated the best candidate, Bernie Sanders. Amen, John Wren. Amen. Let's go to New York and talk with Sam across the Atlantic. Sam, welcome. How are you doing, George? How, uh, is, it, how, how is it looking? It's 45-45 on the poll of polls. Uh, Clinton's double-digit lead that they were talking about last week has certainly dissipated, if not disappeared. How does it look to you? Well, that's, that's the general consensus here. Uh, just a second ago, you read out a tweet that the Democrats deserve Trump because we missed on Sanders, and that's 100% true. Uh, the problem is... Clinton really needed the millennial votes, and the majority of millennials went with Bernie Sanders. And less than 50% are willing to vote for Hillary. Others will stay home, vote Jill Stein. But your, your, the tweet that you just read was 100% right. We, the, the Democrats and Clinton have no one to blame for this other than their own campaign. Absolutely When correct. you give us... When you give us a person, and Bill Maher said condescendingly last week on a show that millennials are too lazy to do the uh, education and learn about Clinton. No, we're the generation of the Internet. We know all about her. We know she voted for the Iraq War, which, by my opinion, means you should already be disqualified. But it's not just that. It continues on. She votes for the Patriot Act, or she votes to intervene in Libya. She you know, lobbied for TPP 45 times, George, and then says, no, no, I was against it. And only because Bernie Sanders pulled you against it. She's a liar. A lies trip oh, off her lips 100%. with such ease 
it's almost demonic to watch her deny things that we know are the truth. 100% correct. And then on top of that, our generation, we grew up with the Iraq War, which, you know, we were told, oh, no, it's 9-11, Saddam did it. No. And then it's weapons of mass destruction, then it's democracy. And then she comes out in the year 2014 and then says, oh, yeah, it was a mistake. Republicans came out before you and said it was a mistake. And then you're saying, well, we should go into, into Syria. Great. Let's go into World War III with Russia because, hey, why not? We have nothing else to do. But, you know, to hell with the infrastructure and tell millennials, oh, free college, free health care is a pie-in-the-sky dream. I mean, for all the flaws you guys are dealing with in England, you should be thankful you have free college, free health care. I mean, this is stuff that we can't even get in this country. We don't have and free tell- college, let me assure you. Thanks to Tony oh, Blair, sorry, free thanks to Tony Blair, uh, free education was abolished, even though he and all his cabinet members had enjoyed it. At my expense, by the way, because I never had any education. I left school at the first opportunity and went to work and pay tax so that Tony Blair and his chums could go to Oxford University entirely free and get a grant to enjoy it with. But no more, Mm -hmm. Sam. No more. Mm -hmm. But we do have a health service. Yeah, well, that's something we... uh, The biggest cause of bankruptcy in this country, George, is... uh medical bankruptcy people will go bankrupt trying to pay bills which is you tell anybody in other you know modernized nation hey you know uh, if your kid has cancer well prepare for bankruptcy because treating him will cause you to become poor and it's it's a nightmare and then we're told oh well here's a candidate who yeah she'll do a little incremental change here and there but hey she's progressive when when was she progressive she has never been progressive and the wall no. street speeches that wikileaks have been mm-hmm. dumping Uh, for weeks on the media with virtually no take-up prove that she says one thing on Wall Street and one thing on Main Street, which is why Wall Street has thrown so many millions of dollars into her campaign chest. Well, well, George, I'm sure sure Goldman Sachs gave her all that money because they care about her stance on birth control. It couldn't be a favor. It couldn't be a you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back notion that's existed in our political system. No, no, it's because they cared about her foreign policy ideas. You know, yeah, sure, by, yeah. if I may steal a quote from you, I have a bridge to sell you then. Sam, as we say in Glasgow, yeah, right. <laughs> Sam in New York, thanks very much for that wonderful call. Let's stay in the United States and talk to Heidi Harris, who is in Nevada in the United States and has a point of view on the presidential election. Heidi, are you there? I am. How are you? I'm good. It's wonderful to talk to you. I'm looking at the poll of polls. It looks neck and neck uh, in the presidential race. What's your take on it? Well, I'm hoping that Donald Trump pulls it out. Not that he was my first choice, but I like him better than her. And I think that the people who like him are being under polled. I don't think they're being represented as well in the polls as she is. And I think that they're going to be very surprised Tuesday night when he becomes the next president. Now, you're a host at uh, AM840 KXNT in Las Vegas. What's the stance of radio stations across the country? Is it the case that most radio stations are with Trump or with Clinton? Well, I think when it comes to uh, talk radio, the conservative kind of talk radio, a lot of my listeners love Donald Trump, even if he wasn't their first choice. And for a lot of people, he was their first choice. Because they felt that a lot of the Republicans who are currently in office have let them down and made them promises they haven't kept. And so they were willing to take a chance on somebody who'd never held elective office. Well, um, um, you know, people say the devil you know. Uh, They do know Hillary Clinton, but they do know that she's a devil. Uh, But it's a fair surmise on most people's part that Trump's a bit of a devil, too. (laughs) Well, you know what? Jesus isn't running this year. So I these are your choices. You've got, you know, these two. Uh, you know, it's funny because they're, they, they both have very high unfavorables, as you, I'm sure you know. And so during most years, she would have no chance if it weren't for the fact that he's running. And in most years, he would have no chance if it weren't for the fact that she's running. That's what's so crazy about this election. That it is. And it's the thing that most people... I must tell you, in the world, can't understand how such a great country, with all its achievements, all its power and wealth, has come up with these two as the final choice. 
I know. That's what I keep saying. We've got over 300 million people, and this is what we come down to, these two. I mean, it's embarrassing. I'm not going to lie to you. It's embarrassing, George. I mean, I know that Jesus isn't going to come back to run for president of the United States, but somebody who's at least not a devil. I can't argue with you. Uh, listen, I'm not happy about the choices. I'm not at all. But I think she's a modern-day Jezebel, and uh, she's corrupt up to her eyeballs. And the only thing that consoles me is maybe if Donald Trump becomes a president, he'll surround himself with people who know more about foreign policy than he does and make the right decisions based on that. Because any successful executive is going to do that. They're going to take advice from people and apply that. So I'm hoping Donald Trump will do that. That's all I can say. All right. Now, you're in the you're in the home of gambling if you were and i'm sure you're not a gambling woman what would your money be on tuesday's result i would be on donald trump winning but then i thought mitt romney would win so i'm no expert on this but i really do think that donald trump's going to pull this out because more and more people are very suspicious of her and with the polls being this tight for a woman who's been in public service whatever you want to call it for 30 years it's shocking that the polls are this tight. So that tells me there's a huge group of people who are going to vote for Donald Trump that Hillary's people are not expecting. They've been in private service, Heidi, not public service. Thank you very <laughs> much, my dear, for coming on. It's great to hear your voice from Las Vegas, Radio AM 840 KXNT. Don't they have such wonderfully exotic titles to their uh, radio stations? We're just plain old talk radio. And this is the mother of all talk shows with me, George Galloway. Now, the Black Prince says, is there any Western democratic system that isn't built on slavery and oppression to at least some extent? Listen, in my lifetime, a black person couldn't urinate in the same pot as a white person in Washington, D.C. There is nowhere in the world other than apartheid South Africa, about which you could say that. The original Americans are this very minute in the state of North Dakota being tear-gassed and bludgeoned to try and defend their ancestral burial grounds from yet another pipeline being laid across it. The genocide of tens of millions of the original Americans, followed by slavery until the later part of the 19th century, followed by Jim Crow, segregation and apartheid? No, I'm afraid not. There is no comparator except apartheid South Africa. Coyote's Bar says, What are your thoughts on the Tory-looking demonstrators at the Russian embassy today? and tit-for-tat at the UK embassy in Russia. I didn't know about that. I must look that up. Alison sent me a message by email. Take heed, your listeners have been warning you that Hillary Clinton will take us into World War Three. You cannot claim every week that Trump is stark, raving mad. Alison, not only can I, I do, and I will, because he is. Fenella says our clueless PM can't be left to make it up as she goes along. Sorry, George, but I welcome this obstruction. Goldilocks says Trump is no worse than previous American presidents. Bush Jr., Bush Sr., Reagan, no difference. And Ten Bob says, do you want UK to leave the single market? And if so, why? Well, if we don't leave the single market, there is no point in leaving the European Union at all. There is no point in soft Brexit. You'd be better to stay. There is no point in a soft Brexit because the Norway model of soft Brexit, which is the only one we know, means that you must continue to accept free movement of labour. That is to say, unlimited immigration from the 26 other countries of the European Union. And you must accept not British court decisions, but decisions made by foreign judges in a foreign country in Brussels. No thanks, Ten Bob. No thanks. Here's Ray in London. Go ahead, Ray. 
Yeah, hello, George. A great show, as, as always. Thanks. I, I, I've just got a, a different spin on things. I think, yes, we want rid of this government, but at the moment, they're on 42%. If we had a general election tomorrow, we would have no time to deselect the 171 MPs who are committed to get rid of Corbyn. That means Labour would be split. In the North, 65% of Labour working voters are opposed to Brexit. The general election would be all about the EU, not about welfare, not about housing, not against about minors. It will all be about EU. The Labour Party will be wiped out. We will have a Tory government more right wing than we've ever seen in our lifetime, backed up by the new UK realigned in the north. It's a complete disaster, the concept of a general election. And this result of this uh, court action is almost certainly going to box PMA into a corner where she has no choice but call a general election. And that, for those of us on the left, could be the disaster because the best hope we have of delivering a fairer and more just society for everybody is with Corbyn and his policy agenda in number 10 and at the moment we're in danger of losing something that we fought so hard and long to achieve well there's there are a number of layers to the argument that you have just made the first is you're the first left-wing person living under a tory government that's demanding no general election I don't want a general election to get the Tories out. In fact, I'm campaigning to keep the Tories in until 2020 when Labour might have a chance of defeating them. You may or may not see the irony of that. Second, I've got bad news for you. The Labour MPs of whom you speak are not going to be deselected. And Jeremy Corbyn is not going to allow them to be deselected. This is a total illusion that you are living under, that Corbyn is going to allow you to deselect MPs that hate him. I'm afraid he doesn't have the iron in his soul to allow that. And thirdly, you are hopelessly mis. Uh, understanding what political uh, forces are now at uh, uh, at large. Th the Theresa May platform will have to be hard Brexit, which I incidentally support. But any party promising less than hard Brexit will get millions of votes, millions of them, from previously non-Labour voters who don't want to leave the European Union. And if they can choose between a soft Brexit platform advanced by Corbyn and a hard Brexit platform advanced by Theresa May, then, frankly, that's Corbyn's best chance to win. Not his worst chance, but his best chance. Fourthly, I think, UKIP are collapsing in the north, in Burnley, last night. Their vote fell by more than 10%. In every by-election that's currently taking place, UKIP are collapsing. And you may have noticed that they're even collapsing on the floor of the European Parliament building, being punched or shoved or bumped into, allegedly, by each other. They don't have a leader. Their leadership election campaign has become a farce. And fifthly, it's entirely contradictory for you to say that UKIP are going to make hay, but Theresa May is going to gain. Because if UKIP are to be uh, uh, rising, they must rise at the expense not just of the Labour Party, but of the, uh, the Conservative Party. Ray, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish you were right, George, but I see it so differently. I want Corbyn. I'm, in a, I'm, I'm a Corbynist uh, through and through. But I, I think it's very, very difficult for many people on the left to be campaigning. I live in Lewisham. We have two of our Labour MPs opposed Corbyn on the Yemen vote. Uh, they've done whatever they can to undermine Corbyn. They're wretches. Corbyn ever. They're, they're, absolute, not... they're absolute wretches, Ray. But do you yeah, think that I Corbyn's going vote. to allow you to deselect them? I'm here to tell you right now, remember you heard it here, you have no chance of deselecting them. Corbyn will not allow it. MacDonald then, will not allow it. Then we will vote Green. We won't be in a position to vote for Corbyn. We well, will that, not that, vote That contradicts for everything you've just said, mate. That, I know, that, I know. That contradicts I everything that you have just said.
But a Labour MP that's opposed to Corbyn is so different to a Tory. That is, to me, in my view, well, I agree the reality. With you. I agree with you. You better call up Jeremy Corbyn, not me. <laughs> Ray, thanks for the call. Megalon says May doesn't really want Brexit, as didn't Boris. And Adam Eccles says I voted to remain, and if remain won and people tried to overturn it, I'd be very angry. Asa says free movement and mass immigration was main issue for 90%, so we must leave the single market to control this. Look, this so called Norway model requires us to continue to accept free movement of labour from the other 26 members of the European Union and continues to subject us to decisions of courts in Europe rather than in Britain. Now, you, whether you like it or not, the overwhelming majority of working class people do not agree to the continuation of the capitalist's wet dream which is free movement of labour. In a capitalist society, an increase in the supply of labour means a decrease in the price of labour. And not just its price, its availability and the terms and conditions on which labour is engaged. That is just basic capitalist economics. And most working class people not middle and upper middle class people, working class people, and not just in the north, but in Wales and in the south west of the country and around parts of London, like Dagenham, like uh, the parts of Essex that voted heavily against remaining in the European Union, will not accept that. That's what they mean by soft Brexit. A continuation, like Norway, of a, a, a form of association with the European Union which requires us to allow free movement and subjects us to the decisions of the European Court. Now, you can celebrate immigration as much as you like. You can love the multicultural nature of our country as much as you like, as I myself do. But these are the hard electoral, political and economic facts. So, that's what May will have to campaign in the general election for. But that leaves 16 million people who voted to remain, as well as some of those who voted to leave, who don't want the hardest form of Brexit. That's why I say... A soft Brexit platform gives Corbyn the only chance, only chance, that he has of winning a general election. Martin's in Doncaster. Let's hear from him. Hello, George. Go ahead, Martin. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that you've elucidated that reality that people, especially the establishment, don't want people to wake up to about um, immigration and its effect on uh, the cost of labour. Because the working class people have realised that, and that is why they voted for Brexit, isn't it, in many cases? Exactly so. And I think we're witnessing one of the most gigantic and huge conspiracies ever, ever seen in this country. Uh, when Parliament resumed, I think we saw a microcosm of it in the Labour coup. I think it was a dress rehearsal for what's happening now, actually, because many of the same people are involved. And these discredited people, um, such as Nick Clegg, who has reduced the size of his party to the contents of a people carrier, has the audacity to come out, you know, and, and, and try and talk down and try and, try and rerun um, the referendum campaign. It's absolutely astonishing. He's, here's a guy who was formed and shaped in the fulcrum of Europe by Leon Britton et al. And um, it's, it's, it's also uh, being discredited with his performance in the 2010 election. Not only him, these Labour MPs like Ed Miliband, who is in my own town, um, Doncaster voted 69% pen, uh, against Brexit. He immediately turns around, is impervious and immune to the way the people think. It's well, just exactly. astonishing. I'm afraid his connection to Doncaster is somewhat fleeting. Absolutely. Somewhat fleeting and somewhat Absolutely. flimsy. Absolutely. And that, that, is what, that is the legacy, isn't it, of, of, of um, Blair's Labour. Yep. Parachuting people from the south, middle class people have no connection, no understanding of, of these countries, and actually aren't interested, and also just want to defy and just um, undermine them. It's, it's just 
bewildering and beyond belief in my opinion. You're absolutely right. Great call. Thanks, Martin, in Doncaster. Frank Kelly emails, I normally agree with you, but in this case, because I was lied to or misinformed, I made the wrong decision and voted for Brexit. And Kevin SMSs, when did the Westminster reprobates ever listen to the populace? Even at elections, you never see the bees. Uh, bees being an abbreviation. Michael Brenya says, so now we don't respect the law. Strange days indeed. Let's all do as we please and rule by referendums. Well, the point is, Michael, you can't change the rule of a referendum after you've had it. If you tell people that this is a referendum and you, the people, will make the final decision, or to use the Prime Minister's words in introducing the bill, you, the British people, will have the final say. Final say. Not Parliament will make the final decision, not the courts will make the decision, but you, the people, will have the final say. You can't change that now, Michael. Sorry. Now, Daniel Rachel is a very cool and clever young man, and he's written a fantastic book called Walls Come Tumbling Down. I suspect that that's a, an optimistic title, because I don't think the walls that we're about to talk about have come tumbling down. But... There is no doubt that just like that trumpet which brought the walls of Jericho down, music, musical instruments and voices and a social movement around them called the anti-racist, anti-Nazi league, rock against racism, all these phenomena played a vital part in stopping so far the development of the kind of mass fascist formations in Britain that exist in uh, <clears throat> the European Union countries in such dangerous profusion. And Daniel, in his book, has charted how that great movement, one of the greatest movements since the 1930s in the movement against fascism in Spain, was built. The walls uh, didn't come entirely down, but we have so far escaped the worst form of organized racist fascist politics. And he joins me now to talk about the book. Daniel, great to see you again. Tell us, um, first of all, how the book is doing, who publishes it, and what its basic premise is. Oh, well, it's a very beautiful book that's published by Picador, and they've, they've, got, they've gone to town on it, which is, is very, a, a very good thing. It's a thick, it's kind of about 600 pages, but a good 200 of those are uh, uh, photographs and illustrations from the period. So, you know, pictorially... The, it is a very beautiful product. Yeah, yeah so all, you know, it's a, it's a very all-round experience. But, uh, the, but, but, but that's uh, ca casing uh, some very serious stuff alongside some great and funny anecdotes there's a real mix in there and the, the premise of the book is very simple it's the music and politics of rock against racism two-tone and red wedge um and and it's the period 1976 to 1992 it's a 16 year period and and it traces the musicians of the day the activists of the day the politicians and it brings them all together so on one hand you might be hearing uh, the voice of neil kinnock and then you're hearing somebody from crass and then you're hearing jerry dammons from the specials and, and so it goes and, and also very many people whose names you perhaps have never heard of or you would pass by on the street without recognizing and yet it's those people who tell extraordinary stories it was using music to assemble audiences to see on the stage multiracial bands multiracialism in practice yeah i mean rock against racism had a, an incredibly fantastic uh, idea and it was very simple and it was this to put on a bill where you first had a punk band which would be white followed by a reggae band which would be black musicians and then they said both those bands have to come together at the end of the evening and perform on stage doing a song now that was uh, extraordinary in 1976 77 78 it hadn't been seen sure there been white musicians with black people within the band and there being the occasional multiracial outfits but this was something that was 
important because of what was happening politically and socially in the United Kingdom at this very moment. And that was the uh, rise of the National Front, who were polling extraordinarily high in, in local elections in places like Leicester, in the east of London. And they were, they were saying that at the next general election, they were going to put a candidate in every single constituency across the United Kingdom. That That's some going. And so culturally musicians turned around and said we have an answer to this and it is to mobilize the youth of a whole generation on an anti-racist agenda and and i guess the the story that i follow that starts with an event with eric clapton and paints a picture of a racist mid-70s britain ends with uh, nelson mandela on stage at wembley fist aloft because he's free south africa is about to become rid of apartheid and in front of him in wembley stadium and billions of people watching tv are calling out because they are anti-racist it's become hip to be anti-racist that wasn't the case in the mid-70s well you you talk as beautifully as you write and uh as a summary of the book, that's pretty near perfect. But there's a reason why you started with an Eric Clapton uh, concert. Because, and, and I'm as a great an admirer of Eric Clapton's guitar playing as anyone alive. Yeah. But he went through a period, as did, I'm sorry to say, the recently departed David Bowie. Uh, in which they were giving expression from the stage of some of the kind of ideas that the National Front were peddling on the political level. It, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because Eric Clapton was loved, you know, for Cream, for Derek and the Dominoes. I loved him because he'd played the guitar solo in While My Guitar Gently Weeps, you know, the Beatles' great track off the White Album written by George Harrison. But in... In August of 76, he was at the Birmingham Odeon on tour. Van Morrison was a special guest and he repeatedly made to the audience outrageous racist comments. He asked the audience who wasn't white to put up their hand. Having engaged those people, he then told them that they needed to go back to their own country. Now, he was drunk that night, and you may think he only said this comment once, but in fact, he repeatedly made it over the evening. And there were witnesses to this, not only a re a, a, an article in Sounds, a reporter, Dave Wakeling, who had gone to form The Beat, was down the front, the, the renowned photographer David Corio was there, and Clapton continually made these comments over the evening. He then went on to repeat very similar remarks backing Enoch Powell who we know in 1968 had made the inflammatory rivers of blood speech um, but you rightly say that this was a climate where rock musicians were were flirting with Nazism uh, David Bowie had a Nazi collection he, he um, a memorabilia collection he was stopped on a train in fact as he crossed over the Russian border and, and the, uh, with his memorabilia collection he arrived at Victoria Station on his return to the UK and he was seen in an open top limousine apparently snapped by Ch Chalky Davis giving what looked like a Zieg Heil uh, arm aloft hand out straight and didn't he say that Hitler was the first uh, rock star first rock and roll super star was Adolf Hitler but you know that the picture was doctored by the enemy and and Chalky Davis is very clear about that and when Bowie was questioned about his potential Nazi leanings he categorically denied it he he spoke out at every opportunity and apologized and and that is significant because Eric Clapton did not do that and has subsequently never done that and he has been repeatedly asked Jerry Dam has asked him at a, a Nelson Mandela concert perhaps this is your opportunity to apologize and he said to Damas don't believe all that you read wow I'm sorry, actually, to hear in such detail uh, those stories. I'm glad you said it, but uh, I'm sorry. I feel sorry in my heart uh, about that. So they were the villains. Uh, who were the heroes? <laughs> well, the hero uh, initially is a person called Red Saunders. 
who's an activist and a real character. He's very funny to read. And he wrote a letter to all of the music papers um, castigating Eric Clapton. And he ended up with a fantastic line in his letter, which said, we need a rank and file movement to get rid of the racist poison in rock. Write to this P.O. Box address. And people did in their hundreds. And from those letters, Rock Against Racism formed. Uh, rock, satellite Rock Against Racism groups grew around the country by 1977 the anti-nazi league of which you will remember yep. had had formed and that and to get and, and in many ways rock against racism became the cultural wing of the anti-nazi league and suddenly the country saw mass carnivals in cities, uh, uh, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Southampton, but N Manchester, but but the big one was undoubtedly in in 1978 April in East London, Victoria Park, Victoria Park. with the Clash, Steel Pulse, Tom Robinson, X-ray Specs, and 80,000 people not pogoing on one hand, then 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 grooving to reggae, but backing minority groups and it wasn't just racism it was anything that was a minority so when when tom robinson sang on stage sing if you're glad to be gay an audience sang with him and the one young uh, chap who was at the gig was billy bragg and at first he was thinking what's all this about gay people and people were snogging next to him men were snogging and he suddenly realized that this was going to be about uh, minorities uniting against fascists fantastic story we'll talk more about it i've got a couple of uh, quite serious questions to ask you well we're getting into the mood here because we're with daniel rachel who's the author of walls come tumbling down the story of rock against racism and two-tone and red wedge covering a 16-year period in which organized fascism in britain was defeated uh, Daniel is not just a great writer, as you're already discovering, he's a great talker too. Let's see if Rashid, who's on the line, can uh, match it. Rashid, welcome. George, am I on the mother of all talk shows? You're on the mother of all talk shows, you're right. You are legend, you are legend. Go ahead, my friend. Hey, George, um, I'm going to get that book. That book sounds great. It's a fantastic uh, book. And not it's not just beautifully written. As Daniel said, it's beautifully encased in uh, with a very heavyweight publisher, Picador. Beautiful illustrations, real real quality. Go ahead, Rashid. Lots of pictures. Lots of pictures. That's good for me. Yeah. Um, George, uh, what I was going to say, um, there's no, there's no, apart from rap nowadays, there's no real genres, other genres, talking about racism and things like that. And we need we need other other genres of music like rock again like I don't know pop pop are not going to do it but to talk about these things. But what I wanted to talk about was racism in Tunisia. I don't know if you've ever come across it or heard any articles or any news things about it. I saw a very very disturbing program on Al Jazeera witness about the, the racism today, 2016, and in the south it's they're saying it's almost apartheid because a couple. A, a black Arab and what they're calling white Arabs, but they're like, you know, the, the standard Arabs, married and they met on a school bus when they were teenagers. And from that day, the whole town was against the marriage. And what they decided to do was segregate the buses now. The black Arabs will go to school, the children will go to school on, on black buses, and the white, so called white Arabs, will go to school on white buses. And it's just disgusting. And they, they put a hidden camera upon a, a black person in, in, the, in the capital. And everybody, a lot of people were abusing him, saying, hey, you stink, get away from me, you black this, you black... It's disgusting. Nowadays, 2016. Well, I'm, I'm very shocked uh, to hear that. Uh, it's not the Tunisia that most of us come across. Uh, but, of course, we stick to the, to the coast, mainly, to the holiday resorts and to yes. Tunis uh, itself. I'm very disturbed to hear that. If anyone's got Have any, it, George, any further particulars... We need to do something about these things. It's terrible. OK. Uh, unfortunately, my writ doesn't run in uh, Tunisia. I'm not, uh, I'm not very well placed to uh, affect that. But I'm glad you brought it up, Rashid. Thanks for nice doing one, so, mate. even if it's uh, slightly off-topic. Um, but he did... Daniel, make a point that I just made to you in the break and I'd like to ask you on air. Um, isn't there a need for another wave? Because whilst organised fascism shows no signs 
of resurrecting in Britain, only a fool would say that racism is dead and that racism no longer exists. And so if there's a need for a new wave, is there a will for a new wave amongst today's musical uh, performers? Well, it's an enormous question. And of course, the, there definitely is a will because all people of sound mind are, are, are anti-fascist and anti-racist. The question becomes, who who is prepared to make a stand? And obviously, in the period of my book, people did make a stand and they put their careers online despite what record companies and what managers may have said to the contrary they made their stand and they wrote it in their lyrics and they spoke about it in their interviews and it was as much uh, an importance as what their whole life as a musician was today Rashid's right that it, it largely comes out of rap it comes out of grime but it, it doesn't seem to come from mainstream pop and I, I would perhaps draw an argument that Tracy Thorne has just put forward in the New Statesman and she she suggests that because of social media, an, an artist is, is very wary of making any form of stand for the fear of what a trolling might come back at them. And, uh, and, and that can, we all know the hatred that can be generated on Twitter and on Facebook. And, and, and perhaps pe musicians and cultural artists are, are nervous for that reason but but you know some but uh, you know we can't repeat what has happened in previous generations because socially and politically every generation is different but uh, it has to come in a different way and where, where that will come from I don't know but you know there's a the, just in uh, Margate at the moment there's a, 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 a white lives matter group which has which has um, made a, another group form called Margate Rock Against Racism. So an instantaneous response. I'm not too sure what response that is beyond a, a, a march and a rally, but it means that people on the street are not going to accept racism in their homes and their cities. Now, um, I've alluded, uh, let me be explicit, in countries like France, uh, to a lesser extent like Italy, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, uh, there is organized either fascism or neo-fascism. Was there a response on the European mainland? Was there a response in, in North America? Yeah. Where fascists use music. I've seen them, uh, documentaries about them, uh, this kind of white power uh, music. Was there a response in North America, in Europe, to... Uh, fascism in the period that you discuss in your book. Yeah, there absolutely was, and it was very, very exciting because one of the things that I was given was the archive of Rock Against Racism, and in that was every single letter that had ever been written, and it's a glorious thing to look back at handwritten letters, and you know, and they're from forty years ago and thirty years ago. But within that was a was a, an, a massive pile labelled International. And and literally, it's as 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 you would expect to find within. And there were letters from as far away uh, as you can imagine, Australia, Japan, and groups were forming um, in in those places using. I mean, this was the great thing about Rock Against Racism. Nobody owned it. It was it was named by a, by the central uh, grouping that had originally formed around Red Sorns's letter. But then it was we don't have any rules. Take it, use it. But it's a, but in the in the spirit in which we form. So in Belgium, they had Rock Against Racism racism carnivals and concerts the the famous misty and roots reggae album was recorded live at one of those at the, what was called the county eurovision um Attila the stockbroker was involved in that gig and 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 the following day or week there was a, an anti-racist uh, rock against racism demonstration in, in the main uh, city uh, that he describes in the book in America uh, uh, the, I've seen the badge for New York's rock against racism and those concerts still continue to this day uh, it, 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 it's such an identifiable idea that and so simple an idea stand on a stage play music and uh, bring together black and white bands and be anti-racist. How, how fantastic is that? Indeed so. Um, now, uh, you talked about some of the uh, heroes earlier. Uh, have any of them stayed with the project, stayed with the program? I mean, I, I know people in the specials, for example, uh, Jerry in particular, 
uh, and they have never changed their political stripe. Uh, but I'm think what I'm thinking of may be unfair. Quite a lot of the anti-Thatcher stand-up comedians went on to become multi-millionaires and have ended up in quite a different political place. Did that happen to any of the main players in the Rock Against Racism movement? Well, one of the one of the exciting. Uh uh, things I found by meeting. I mean, I, I talked to over a hundred people, um, and, and I've described the kinds of people I met, and and there was a burning passion in virtually every single person that I talked to. Not only about that period, but they they hold that pa the passion still now and are still active now. I mean, the, the the great example, I guess, would be the the concert for Corbyn that's happening in Brighton in December and headlined by a, a, a super group of Paul Weller and um, uh, what's his name, a uh, shipbuilder, Robert Wyatt. Um, they're, they're doing a group together. Now, Robert Wyatt, as we know, wrote, um, uh, put, covered the Elvis Costello and Clive Langer song, Shipbuilding, about the contradictions of what was happening in the Falklands War. And Paul Weller was the, was w the architect alongside um, uh, Billy Bragg and Anna Joy David of Red Wedge. Now, P P Paul's got back into politics because he has he's been uh, unequivocal. I saw him the other day in uh, in uh, Portobello Road. Ah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Robert Wyatt has been on my my television show, and I'm in uh, close touch with him. Did you talk, talk to Paul about the event? Uh, no, I didn't. Right. Uh, it was uh, a, 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 just a brief pass by, but uh, it's fantastic that he's back in politics mm. uh, because he's not only such an iconic figure he is a link to this very period that we're talking and then the great thing about paul's involvement in red wedge was i mean just very briefly red wedge was a, a, an independent autonomous alliance of of people that have come through punk either directly like paul or influenced like billy brought bringing together all the number one artists and great artists of the time madness the communards and they went and said we are all against margaret thatcher and we need her out at the next general election. The best way to do that is to get behind the Labour Party. They weren't saying they were wholeheartedly in support of the Labour Party. They were definitely for them, but not of them. And they used the what the Labour Party offered them, which was a room at the headquarters. Um, but from day one, Paul said to any, everybody, I am suspicious of whether we are being used and we have to uh, think about that in everything we do. And he, he, Billy says he maintained that all the way through it. But the great thing was that he, it didn't deter him from making a stand uh, for something that he believed in, was, which was the deindustrialization de of this country and a belief in young people, a belief that they didn't have to be the high levels of unemployment, a belief that youth could start at their own projects with fanzines or money could be injected into you know, youth centres. Paul did all those kind of great things, but used his music as a way to back it all, which is very exciting. Very exciting indeed, and anyone who buys this book or even borrows it, uh, will not be disappointed. It is an exciting, wonderful book by a great new writer, Daniel Rachel, author of Walls Tumbling Down. We're discussing Brexit and the High Court decision yesterday to throw a gigantic judicial spanner in the works of the implementation of the British people's decision in the EU referendum. We're talking about racism fascism and how the rock and rollers responded to it and wondering where the next wave of that response will come from and of course as the polls become officially neck and neck in the United States 45 45 between the devil and the devil we're asking what happens next on Tuesday in the United States now, Chris Darlaston uh, uh, tweets, I went to see the specials last night and their two-tone anti-racist message is as relevant today as in 1979. Tegwin Half says, yes, we do need a new wave of anti-racist music. I don't think I know of any new music which is anti-racist. We need more rock against racism concerts. Alan Ingle says Bowie's flirtation with fascism was as a result of being, quote, out of mind, totally, completely, 
crazed. Sharp Adamant says, uh, read the U.S. election choice. Democrat voters never had a real choice. Hillary Clinton was prepared to do, say, anything to bury Bernie. More fool him for allowing himself to be buried, if you ask me. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. We are here, says I O Tigernich. Forgive me if I mispronounced that. Uh, she's all the world's got right now. You prefer a Trump presidency? Lesser of two evils, says Joe Alessi. Well, as I've said here many times before, the lesser of two evils is still evil. And going for the lesser of two evils merely encourages more evil because it means that the evildoer can get as evil as he likes. And as long as his rival is only marginally less evil, they'll be the lesser of two evils. Do you get my point, Joe? I'm with Dr. Jill Stein and have been from the beginning, head and shoulders above the other candidates. But that's not the view of my next guest. I think Bill Keeler, morning show host at WIBX in New York, USA. And I'm glad to say Bill joins us now. Bill, how's it looking? Well, I got to tell you, it's uh, it's tight. And since the FBI announcement, FBI announcement came last week, uh, we've just been watching the polls, and things have really tightened up. Not only when it comes to the popular vote, but the electoral college, which of course is the all important uh, uh, avenue that you gotta you're gonna have to go down in order to uh, to see victory. And it's tight right now, almost a dead heat. Yeah, well, I'm looking at the poll of polls now, uh, and it's 45-45, actually a dead heat, because, of course, there are other candidates in the race, though they are uh, way, way, way uh, off the map behind. Uh, but 45-45 yeah. in the popular vote. But um, in the so-called swing states, Trump is uh, beginning to catch up to reach Clinton's position and in some cases, uh, overhaul it, and there's still uh, a few days to go. So the Democrats, we have a saying here, Bill, squeaky bum time. It must be squeaky bum time. Uh, they must be shifting uneasily in their chairs in the Democratic National Committee. Oh, I think that is uh, definitely the case. There is no, nothing is in the bag here. Um, and it, it's very interesting. We just heard word that Trump is, uh, has some unique, and I didn't get the full story yet, but there's some unique form of advertising that Trump is spending millions on here for the final weekend. Uh, and, of course, the Democrats are doing doing the same. Obviously, there must be somebody out there they feel at this point they still can sway, and they're going to spend a lot of money over the course of this weekend and into Monday in order to do it. So, uh, But what do they do? Uh, a lot of it has to be really selling Hillary is someone who isn't the lesser of two evils, somebody who, as the Democrats will say, is probably one of the most qualified candidates in history, um, at least in modern history in the United States, to run for president. That's the message they have to sell. And Trump just keeps banging the drum uh, that she is crooked and that there's an investigation on. And, of course, uh, in a, inevitably she's going to be indicted. Now, that hasn't been proven, but as long as Trump says it, everybody in his uh, right side certainly they certainly believe it. And it's not just the emails, Bill. Uh, in the London Times today, there's a very significant article that the feds have been investigating her charity uh, over yes. 12 months and that charges may well be recommended on that front too. Well, that at this point is, uh, is something that Fox News came out with a story earlier in the week that was they had to back away from because they said that it's pretty much inevitable there will be an indictment. Well, that turns out to be not true. It does seem, however, that the FBI, within the FBI, we're hearing a lot about the fact that there is disagreement uh, whether or not they should have come out uh, in the open last week on Hillary Clinton and disagreement that any of this stuff should have made it uh, to the forefront before the election. So I'm not sure that there is uh, that, that an indictment is in an inevitable but i got to tell you does it really matter because uh, it's out there and it's out there the weekend before it's real trouble for hillary clinton now uh, we were talking earlier to uh, another uh, radio host uh, from las vegas um she's backing uh, trump um but 
she agreed with me that um, Clinton uh, is not just the worst uh, candidate the Democrats could have chosen, notwithstanding the experience point that you make, but that Trump is also the worst that the Republicans could have chosen and that, that any other Republican could have beaten Clinton perhaps easily and any other Democrat could have beaten Trump. So I ask you the same question I asked her. How is it that a great country like the United States with all its talent, all its achievements, all its power and wealth has come up with arguably the two least popular people in the country to run against each other? You know, it's a great question, and I, I probably uh, have to agree. Um, uh, Trump, I, I find personally, as being a dangerous candidate, uh, Hillary Clinton has a lot out there. There's a lot of baggage that she's carrying. Some of which, by the way, her campaign, when she initially began to run, knew nothing about. They didn't know about the server. They didn't know there was going to be something on the Clinton Foundation. So a lot of this stuff has come as a surprise. But you do hear things like, Boy, uh, if they'd have made the decision eight months ago, ten months ago, to uh, bring Biden in into the race, uh, things would be uh, a lot different. Um, so I agree. Uh, probably, at the, at the very least, in terms of perception, the two worst candidates you could have running. So how do we, the United States, get here? I'm baffled. I can't answer that question. Um, I, I don't know. Well, it's very honest of you. Let me ask one last, if I may, Bill. Uh, what does all this mean for the other races that are taking place? For, I think there's 26 governorships up for grabs. Uh, there's the Senate. There's the House. How is this tightening race uh, going to impact on that? Well, I think that what we have learned, it seems that the, uh, the FBI announcement last week by the way, has completely overshadowed any of the Trump stories with the, the, the sexual assaults or, you know, whether that's true or not. But uh, it has affected, which is very, very important here, the races in the House. And uh, I, I pretty, I'm most pretty confident that the, uh, the Democrats or the Republicans will hold on to the, uh, to the House. The Senate is now in, in question. Uh, and, and it, seemed very, very likely that Democrats would retain or regain control of the Senate. I don't think that's the case now. I think there's some very, very tight races. And again, this is up for grabs. I truly believe not only in the House and Senate, uh, but also in the presidency. We may not know come Wednesday morning who the president of the United States is. And in some of these, uh, these down ballot races, uh, who your next congressman is. Bill, you've been a gentleman and a scholar. Thanks for joining us. Bill Keeler, morning show host at WIBX Radio in New York in the United States. What a fascinating cliffhanger this is all turning out to be. Uh, our sage, John Le Boutillier, could not be with us this evening because he's playing baseball. Three hours of baseball. Now, I don't know what age John is, I rather formed the view that he was my age. And trust me, I couldn't play three hours of baseball. Mind you, there's a lot of standing around in baseball, isn't there? You're only uh, in action uh, every now and again. But we definitely will speak to John next Friday to look back at this result. The delightfully named and delightful person she is, Strawberry Shortcake, says, Can you see the Parliamentary Labour Party letting him, she means Corbyn, deliver hard Brexit? They won't remain. Never mind soft Brexit. They'll never campaign for it. You've missed my point, Strawberry. My point is that Corbyn will campaign for a soft Brexit. And moreover, that that's the only chance he has of being elected as Prime Minister. David Scott says, should Blair have deselected Corbyn? What, like he did me, you mean? Marie, 21, says, Theresa May is a bit creepy. I think it's the way she walks, creeping into number 10. Something about her I don't like. And James Taylor says, let's just get behind Corbyn whichever way we can. Soft or hard Brexit. I don't care. Just get Jezza in power. Adam Eccles again says, do you think companies will leave the UK like they said they will when we leave the single market? Well, there's no reason why leaving the European Union needs, necessarily needs, 
to affect free trade between us and members of the European Union. I've said here before, Adam, they sell us much more than we sell them. If they put tariffs on our goods, we'll put tariffs on theirs. If you think that anybody is more nervous in all this than the German motor uh, manufacturers, you'd be wrong. There is no reason why leaving the European Union means that we should not have free trade with members of the European Union. And I believe that we will reach a collective deal on that. I believe that is up for negotiation. And if they don't put tariffs on us, we oughtn't to put tariffs on them. And that way, we leave the European Union, we regain control of all of our own affairs, and we don't suffer economic damage. On the contrary, we then have the entire world as our oyster. Now, if you're saying to me that the European Union, in order to vindictively react to a major country leaving the Union, is going to damage its own trade, its own business. Well, that will hasten what I believe to be inevitable, which is major change in the European Union, major change in the relationships within it, major change in relation to its single currency, which is not working and can't work because you cannot synchronize the economies of highly developed industrial powerhouses like Germany and poor countries like Greece, like Portugal, like Spain. So I believe major change, a complete rewriting of the European Union's internal and external relationships is underway and is going to be expedited by our leaving of the European Union. We're competing in a rigged election. It's a rigged election, folks. She shouldn't be allowed to run. She should never have been allowed to run for the presidency. I say it's rigged. Now, Stephen Hunter asks, would leave still win today? Or is it really too close to call? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, Stephen, but I do have the book in which I predicted the outcome of the EU referendum to the very percentage point, as indeed I did the Scottish referendum before it. Aren't they lucky I don't do the national lottery? At least not yet. Let me talk to my old adversary up in Liverpool, Mark, on Donald Trump. Mark, welcome back, son. Hello, George. How are you doing, mate? I'm great, mate. Good to hear from you. Go ahead. Uh, all right, thank you. Listen, mate, I've just got to say something because I'm so, I was fuming at first, but now I'm just disappointed in you. So, listen, I want to say something about the referendum and Brexit, please. And I'm so disappointed in you, mate. I've got to say it. I You're totally... always disappointed in me. Don't yeah, pretend, am, don't pretend that this is something new. You're always disappointed in me. Go ahead. Yeah, I am, mate, because of Ray here and you know that. Well, listen, let's get it right. And for, for people telling us what we think, I totally accept that we voted out. Totally accepted the idea. But, but for the idea that our local MPs can't go and voice the concerns is absurd. Especially when 48% voted to remain. Now, if it was 75-25, I'd have to the court my logic and accept it. But don't forget, whole cities voted to remain. Liverpool voted for rem to remain. 42% of Liverpool voted to leave. Well, it doesn't matter. Not enough. From, uh, from areas, right? For areas. So it's a movable feast. Some majorities are, uh, are uh, conclusive, but other majorities are not. OK, forget that. Let's just look at the country then, right? Let's just get back to my main points. For areas that have benefited so much vastly from the, from the EU, right? You know that we've already told us it's going to stop in 2020. We know that. For not to be able to go and put our cases across that are worrying these communities. But more importantly, you think that we should be all right about handing this over to me? No, Boris, no, 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 no. Hammond, Fox, un un baby, are you out of your mind, George? Unfortunately, you failed to grasp what I was saying. What type of Brexit, what our negotiating position is, is perfectly 
within the power, the purview of the parliament and the MPs. But whether or not to press the Article 50 button has nothing to do with the MPs, and it has nothing to do with the courts. That matter was decided by more than a million and a quarter votes in June of this year in the referendum. OK, George, well, I want to say this. I think it should be done for the people. Forget all that law, lark. It should be done for the people. Don't forget, this won't just be for the people who voted Remain. This is a chance for people who vote for Brexit. Brexit has got concerns to go out into the public arena and see our MPs putting our voices across. No, well, there's no reason for you to be disappointed because I agree with all of that. Now, you said you wanted to talk about Trump. Do you still okay. want to? Yeah, I do, yeah. Go on. Do uh, you know what, mate? I just can't believe what's happening. Now, I've got two close friends who are American, mate, and for years we sparred off each other. I've not been, I haven't been a big fan of Americans, but you turn out to me and say, what you're on about, Mark? Look at your record collection, Bob Dylan, Miles Davis, Larry Coriel, etc., etc. And I come back with you just obnoxious and you're loud and you're too egocentric. And then what did he go and do? Put a man like this forward. The jaws have just hit the ground. They're so disappointed, mate, in their, in their own uh, compatriots. I feel sorry for America. I feel sorry for the rest of the world. And hating Clinton isn't a good enough reason to go to support Trump. No, I, I don't support. Reason. I don't support either of them. I, no, I, I no. wouldn't. I wouldn't dream of voting for either Trump or Clinton. No, I know you wouldn't. No, I know that, mate. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not throwing the throwing that. Do you know what? I heard a woman the other day, right, in a Democ in a Republican area, canvassing the head of the area. So I don't know who's, what reporter was. Went up to her and said, "Well, why aren't you voting for, for Hillary Clinton?" She said, because I'm not voting for someone like Barack Obama to carry on implementing Sharia law. What type are we dealing with here, George? Oh, there's a lot of nutters in America. Unfortunately, they've got guns. Mark, thanks yeah. for the call. Here's Andrew in Helens Bay in the north of Ireland, where I'm headed to Newry, Derry and Belfast later this month. Andrew, go ahead. All right, George. Pleasure, pleasure to speak to you this evening. I hope you and John Le Batillier have a big house in New Zealand at the ready if uh, the worst happens, because I'll probably join you there. Yes. Um, so, well. No, the prices really are the prices are uh, relatively high. I'm not sure how big the house will be, but we'll accept visitors. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, it's really a lose-lose scenario. One is risking World War Three with Russia, and the other one is is literally a sexist, filthy sleazebag. Um, who could have his hand... That's a hell of a way to talk about Bill Clinton. <laughs> well, I like both of them anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I do believe, um, scarily enough, that Trump may win it, because um, you'll remember, obviously, even back to Brexit, you know, it was 12% going into uh, the final day, and it won. And even... even you Also, you may remember... Um, you remember Quebec in 1995 when it was virtually guaranteed that Quebec would gain independence from Canada, and yet they they stayed in Canada, albeit by the narrowest of margins. So you can never trust the polls, so you can't. No, that's a fact. And uh, don't forget that until about 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, the bookies uh, were giving only an 8%, I think it was, 8% chance of Brexit winning. So... People are under-recording things like Brexit, things like Trump. They're under-recording it, either deliberately or uh, systematically uh, as a result of some flaw in their methodology. Or, and I think this is more likely, just as people were once described as shy Tories, shy to say they were voting Tory, so there are shy Trumpers as well they might be. I wouldn't like to admit to anyone that I was voting for Donald Trump, even if I was. Oh, yeah, totally, totally agree with you. Um, but you see this historical relationship um, between Britain and the USA. I believe that whoever wins, we're going to have to distance ourselves from those two. You and bet. Start looking f further eastwards. You, you bet. Know, to China the one, and Russia. The, the one redeeming, one redeeming feature of a Trump victory would be that the slavish obeisance to the United States by politicians in Britain and in Europe and elsewhere in the world would have to come to an end because no one in their right mind would have as their default position that America is 
the leader, uh, America is right, and that America must be followed. No one mm -hmm. in the right mind. Andrew, I hope to see you. I'm in Newry, Belfast and Derry with my Blair film. I hope you'll come and see it and come up and talk to me. Thanks very much for the call. Um, let me take some more tweets while I can. Simon Brian Anderson says, Immigration also keeps house prices and rents at an unaffordable level. And Finlay sends an email, Call me a traitor but I like our legislation being accountable to the European Court and the Declaration of Human Rights. It's given us some of our best laws. Well, first of all, the Declaration of Human Rights was signed long before we joined the European Union. In fact, it predates the existence of the European Union, and no one, no right-thinking person, would want to resile from it. But as to liking our legislation, being accountable to a court in a foreign country, unaccountable, unaccountable, unelected. Well, Finlay, I just don't get that, I must tell you. Charlie O says, Bowie made a lot of money from Brits. Shame that he wanted to be buried in the United States. And Eva on the run says, Corbyn has to rid the Labour Party of the Red Tories or they will undermine him in any election fight. Simon says, if Corbyn doesn't deselect MPs, then I'm off somewhere else. The Labour Party no longer represents me. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And Simon James says, I agree. Dr. Jill Stein is the only sane choice this year. Justin Hesford says, my understanding from Labour rules that any current MP has to face a trigger ballot if wishes to stand again. Your understanding, unfortunately, Justin, is faulty. Now, Let's hear from another Justin in Wigan on Article 50. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> hey, George. Hi. It's the very same, Justin. Oh, fantastic. How's that for timing? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, yeah, I'm, I, that's the way I read it. And, uh, no, no, it, it's, it's, not, it's not right. Uh, Only if they're affected by boundary changes. Uh, all right. Well, I'll, I'm going to uh, do some more research on that. Yep. Anyhow. Um, I printed off the, the whole bloody booklet on the Labour rules and... Yeah. But it seems difficult to make sense of. Well, of course, but uh, rules are rules uh, that don't apply when the Labour National Executive decides that they don't. Mm. And indeed, they went to court to establish that very principle. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn that. does not have the will, and the National Executive has no intention of allowing significant numbers of deselections to take place, I'm sorry to say. Okay. Uh, so on to the, bre the Brexit, the uh, Article 50 business and this yeah. court um, ruling. Uh, are you still, after speaking with your, your expert earlier, of the opinion that, that we should be blaming uh, the judges, that they've done something wrong legally to subvert the... Uh, I absolutely am, and yeah. I hope that the Supreme Court overturns it. Yeah. Because but, the, the, the Article 50 is an inescapable, automatic uh, consequence of the decision of the referendum. No one, not Parliament, nor courts, has a right not to press that button. And yet it will now get bogged down in the House of Commons, but mainly in the House of Lords. And it will not be triggered for a very long time. And even if it is triggered, it may come with sufficient complications and obstacles as to render it inoperable. And there are plenty of powerful people in this country who want to have that situation brought about. Well, uh, how have you come to the opinion that um, the referendum has this automaticity to it when when the guy earlier would seem to be saying different? The no, he, no, what, no the, Justin, what he was just saying... Just a minute. Just no, let me finish. No, no, but but I, the, I just want, to correct, of, I want he, to correct that point oh, and then I'll let you back in. Whatever the guy earlier was saying, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying that as you cannot leave the European Union without triggering Article 50, if the people in a binding referendum, which is what Cameron said it was when he introduced the bill, if the people vote to leave, then Article 50 is an automatic response to that decision. Otherwise, it wasn't a binding referendum, Justin. Well, that's right. It wasn't a binding referendum because 
because Cameron says doesn't make it give it a legal status. Yes, it does. Yes, no, it, it does. does. Yes, it does. What um, the Prime Minister says in the House of Commons on behalf of the government has the force of government policy. So it was. There's no question about that. He said, and I'll quote, that the British people will have the final say. He so didn't it, it, say subject to the courts, subject to the parliament, the final say. If, if I, I, I really, I'll have to research that, but I fancy it's wrong um, that, the, that the prime minister can um, just say something. He might have a slip of the tongue. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you're saying it's, it becomes legally binding. It does. If, it if, does Tony, if Tony Blair advocates that we're going to stand side by side whatever with the with the uh, americans it means he, that he doesn't, that's he, the doesn't, he doesn't have that power yes he does oh, he has no, that power I'll as the to, as, I'll have to check well it. he does have that power you, you can check it with me justin i was there for almost 30 years he has the power to act on behalf of the monarch to say that the decision of the referendum will be final and if you accept that that's what he said, and that that's what he meant, and that that's what the House voted overwhelmingly for, then Article 50 is not in the power of the Parliament. It's an automatic consequence of the decision of the referendum. Right, so, okay, I hear your point, and we disagree on that. Um, and I... I how are you meeting all the people who, who seem to f take the contrary position, who, who seem to think that there's no automaticity in it, this, this referendum had an advisory uh, status because it didn't explicitly say um, that it was a decision? No, you see, this is just obfuscation by people who want to frustrate the decision of the electorate because they didn't like it. If you're seriously saying to me that you thought that that gigantic Everest of a referendum that we just had was merely advisory, then either you're not looking closely enough, or frankly, you're dissembling, Justin. Well, let's, let's just be clear about one thing. I, I am for Brexit, OK? Um, but in the mo on the morning of the vote, my f I wasn't jumping for glee because it was 52% 48. I thought that that wasn't a sufficient enough mandate. So, you know, I'm not I'm not coming coming at it from a, a a Ramona point of view. In that case, it's the it's the former of my options. You haven't looked closely enough. It wasn't advisory. Right. It was the final say. That's what the prime minister said in introducing it. Right. Well, we'll have to. I'll have to uh, re research that myself. And, and uh, all right, it's come very back. interesting to come, uh, come back to next week. That. Yeah, come back later, week. George. Thanks a lot. Mike. Okay, Justin. Thanks. Let me uh, take a quick break. Let me hear from Anna in Merseyside. Anna, welcome. Hello. Hi. Um, great show as always. Thank um, you. I was calling in because I, I thought it was interesting hearing uh, your guest Daniel um, earlier, and. Um, in some ways, although these seem like separate topics, Brexit and the U.S. election uh, and your guest you had on talking about his book, in some ways I think there is a sort of common thread that runs uh, on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment that loosely links in with uh, the guest you had earlier. And I think that despite, you know, the spike in incidents that's happened uh, post Brexit. I, I like to think that a lot of progress has been made on racism and sexism in this country and that I think on the whole there's a consensus of opinion that we don't uh, tolerate um, outdated views anymore, thankfully. Um, but what I don't like to see is feminism and anti-racism or anti-Semitism being used as a smokescreen by the liberal left or chattering classes, if you like, and as a substitute for, I think, real politics of substance. And I think that we've seen a little of that on both sides of the Atlantic, I think. I mean, I'd like to make very, very clear, I, I'm no Trump supporter, and especially as a, a serious feminist, I, I'm not pro-Trump in any way. But on the other hand, I think, you know, anyone who's read anything on the internet, if you followed the release of emails um, by Hillary Clinton, and, and just even even without WikiLeaks, I think if you just look back um, over her 
her policies and decision making her you know just very recently you know the destruction in Libya for example that she was very much involved with I fail to see how you can call yourself feminist and 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 support the likes of Hillary Clinton I, I for me that's not real feminism and I think that we've seen a lot of that on both sides of the Atlantic we've had working class movements who have reacted against globalization and I think that um the media has been somewhat patronising in terms of trying to come to terms with what both of those movements behind Corbyn and, and, and over across the Atlantic um, have been about. Well, um, if there was a prize for the best call of the evening, you definitely would win it. That, <laughs> that was a perfect summation. If you opposed uh, the EU, you were a racist. If yeah. you're against potentially unlimited immigration into the labor supply in Britain, yeah. you are somehow a reactionary. Yeah. If you oppose Hillary Clinton, you're a sexist. Well, mm -hmm. you, you're too young to remember. We've had a woman leader in Britain before. I, I'm not actually. I did live under Thatcher, so and, All right. and that's a perfect example. It is. It's, it is no step forward to get Margaret Thatcher into Downing Street. Mm -hmm. It was a disaster for yeah. women and men and children and yes. the country and nowhere uh, more than in Liverpool. So yeah. the idea that one uh, should support Clinton because she's a woman or one should support the EU because people call you a racist if you don't, yeah. these are the default positions of the so-called liberals, small yeah. l. The yeah. liberal guardian class. Yes. And yeah. these are often people who benefit from the European Union. I myself, I'm a working class person, but I have a, 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 a much higher standard of living than most working class people. Mm -hmm. And I benefit. I can get staff. I can get served. I can go and eat in places that suit me because of large-scale immigration. Yeah. But if you are a worker in the north, in the southwest, in Wales, the EU has been a disaster for you. And the Brexit result was a revolt of the have-nots, the people who have not gained. And you're right to say the support for Trump, some of it is venal, vile, racist, yeah. sexist, no doubt, but it represents the same kind of rejection of the political class, of the political normalcy that tens, scores of millions of people have not benefited from, Anna. Yeah, I mean, for myself in Liverpool, I mean, we, there's a lot of European social fund money that, that, that has, you know, Liverpool has benefited from as a city. But I think... For myself, I mean, there are things of grave concern. I think the increasing corporatization of the European Union with the likes of TTIP and CETA and these trade deals where you're looking at, you know, UK sovereignty being undermined. And I think it's that much more difficult to protest. I mean, I think countless people across Europe signed petitions uh, over TTIP because our own elected MEPs couldn't get access to the draft document. And it was only after people across Europe signed petitions that our elected MEPs were finally allowed to look at draft documents of this trade deal. And even then, their mobile phones were removed from them. They couldn't take anything in to record or make notes. And I would imagine that that's a fairly complex document. There's no way you can, you know, take a glance exactly. through that without, you know, being able to make notes on it or, you know, photograph it in some way so that you can, you have to go into a specific room and things like your mobile phone are removed from you. I mean, that's what I've read. So I think there are concerns, I think, both on the, as you were saying earlier in the program, I, I think, you know, when people were talking about Brexit, there are people across the left and the right for different reasons, I think, who uh, we have more in common, I think, um, over these issues. And, and especially, you, you look at the headlines that we had and the reaction of certain sections of the media regarding, I, I don't remember which paper it was, but the headline 
<clears throat> the, you know, the rather dubious headline about he's openly gay Olympic fencer, and, and, and the liberal media jumped on this. Mm. But, but what I find offensive is that they have not jumped on the anti-democratic nature exactly of this, which so. we, we likewise saw with, with the actions of the NEC and Corbyn and what happened there. Exactly. The, and the, I've, got, I've, got, dis- I've got to stop because I've got a lot of people in the queue. Don't be a stranger. Call me again. I really like talking to you. It was an excellent call. Let me hear from John in Glasgow. John. Good evening, George. Evening. Judging from the US news channels and the, the opinion polls, uh, we may only be days away from a, an extraordinary rendition, rendition flight on Air Force One landing at Glasgow Presswick Airport to bring President Donald Trump to Scotland. <laughs> We will have a comedic moment that will rival the reception committee that Alex, Alex Salmond arranged for the Chinese pandas arriving at Edinburgh Airport on their way to Edinburgh Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, how many chances does uh, an organisation need and a first minister uh, and a party need? I mean, they have they, they, they continually lead the Scots to defeat on the wrong side of arguments, left, right and centre. The track record makes Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites look like a success story. <laughs> Uh, Brilliant, John. I'm stopping you there because you, it, your call could not get better. Fantastic. Let's talk to Vivian in Nottingham. Vivian, welcome. Hello, George. Good evening. Good evening to you, sir. George, big fan of what you're trying to do, mate. Big fan of what you're trying to do. George, this is uh, a quick uh, quick two points. Um, do you think that Trump was selected um, because I thought he would be basically a walkover, a pushover, some, someone of no substance um, to contend for, 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 for the presidency. So, no, you know, no, he won, he, won, uh, he won the nomination after a very, yeah. very ferocious fight. And the ruling class in America do not want Donald Trump at all. The idea that mind. this is some kind of conspiracy, uh, I, I mean, frankly, uh, I, I'm not sure I'd put money on him uh, being healthy for very much longer. Uh, yeah. So the ruling class does not want Trump. The ruling class is entirely behind Hillary Clinton. All the money is behind Hillary Clinton. All the military industrial complex, for very good reason, is behind Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, yeah. Because one thing, one thing I've noticed in the past couple of years with all the presidents, um, that, that I've not seen a president that I've been voted in by, via popular vote in a long, long time in the United States, George. Well, uh, I, I mean, I don't, that's why I'm putting my money on Hillary to win. Well, the the um, argument might not be settled uh, on Wednesday morning. I'm hoping well, that it is because I, I'm making a, a TV program in the middle of the night. But yeah. uh, it's uh, it's uh, quite possible that just like uh, George Bush versus Al Gore, Kerry, it, yeah. it may be some days before we know who the next president of the United States is. Vivian, thanks for the call. Don't be a Thank stranger. You, Here's Robert in London, probably the last call of the evening. Go ahead, Robert. Hello, George. Uh, yes, just going to say, you probably, you're a football fan, you've probably seen the furor about this uh, poppy issue ah, during yes. the week. Yes. Yes, so it's just, uh, I want to know your views on this. I find it quite hypocritical, the fact that um, everyone's saying, oh, you have to wear a poppy. Firstly, you have to wear a poppy. This is quite a new development. First and f- first and foremost, and uh, secondly, um, they're getting angry about FIFA saying that you should not be wearing a poppy because some people might find it quite inflammatory, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable standpoint to say because not because so much of what the poppy um, would do between England and Scotland, but imagine you gave a, a Clark Blanche to nations across the world in international matches to wear political symbols. It'd be it would be it'd be dangerous. Well. Um... The last time England played a game on uh, Remembrance Day, they didn't wear a poppy. Precisely. And Precisely. there was no furor about it at all. Um, let, uh, let me set out my views uh, carefully yeah. and not in an inflammatory way. Yeah. If you can imagine the largest possible capital H in fright, in front of the word hypocrite that you used... <laughs> That is how I feel about the British ruling elite and huge sections of the British media on this issue. As I put it on Twitter earlier this week, the larger the poppy, the earlier worn, the more waxen with grief the face at the cenotaph 
the bigger the hypocrite we're talking about. As they are standing there with their heads perfectly bowed, having measured how perfectly to bow, they are either in war, killing people, including our own people, or they're planning where to kill next. They are gigantic hypocrites. Now, I have, I used to wear a poppy because I believe that the First World War was the greatest crime ever carried out against the people of this country by oh, our own rulers. Definitely. Our rulers are responsible <laughs> for the flower of a generation being cut down on Flanders fields and elsewhere. The Second World War, I believe, was the noble, just, and heroic war and was our finest hour. And I used to wear a poppy for that reason. But this hysteria, this almost poppy fascism that has developed in this country over the last 15 years cannot be separated from the rise and rise of militarism and war in our country. And I will not participate in it. So I have no poppy. And I view with suspicion all of those in public life who are brandishing their poppies. And I look at the voting rolls. I look to see if this man or this woman who's wearing a big poppy in Parliament or on television supported the killing of a million people in the war in Iraq, is supporting the destruction of Libya, of Syria, of Yemen. And if they are, I put that gigantic capital H in front of the word hypocrite and I pin it, metaphorically speaking, on them. What do you think of that? I entirely agree. And just on the point of the First World War, we went to war, just on, before you got into show now, we went to the First World War to protect our own naval supremacy. We gave that away to America. <laughs> exactly so. It was a war between cousins as to who would have the bigger empire. And therefore, every man who fell in it on any of the sides involved in it was killed by their own rulers. The greatest crime, I repeat it, ever committed against the British people was the First World War. Robert in London, thanks for giving me the opportunity to set out my views on that in advance of Remembrance Day on Friday. Simon says, I would vote Trump with no shame. Call me a racist, call me a bigot, a fascist. I'm used to that after voting Brexit.